So here's a piece of arrested development that I came up with. Uh, the power seeding company, a very pretentious, bringing nuclear energy to the world. Now, um, this here uh, presentation I've been working on, um, and I stopped working on it uh, since since my visit to Canada earlier this year. And that's mainly because of the Corona crisis. And when it hit, I started to doubt everything that was happening, including what I was doing. And um, so I've put it on hold. And I think that the time is ripe to uh, to share my thoughts about this this thing and uh, you know share it with you guys and you know ha have a talk about it. So let's see. Um, our challenge, many of us already know what the challenges are, but let me reiterate, uh, we don't add low carbon energy sources fast enough to mitigate our influence on climate change. And then there's more low carbon energy generation is needed to lift people out of poverty. Now, low carbon, it, it, the energy to lift people out of poverty doesn't necessarily have to be low carbon. Let's, let's remember that these people from poor countries they're going to you know use whatever energy they can afford so it has to be cheap and uh, everybody knows that the um, gdp per capita and the energy prosperity are inextricably linked with each other so if you lift the energy availability for people they will inadvertently become more wealthy and that has everything to do not just with you know running your fridge having a computer a telephone some lighting but also having the energy to create goods uh, to you know uh, build businesses you name it and then finally there is the challenge that uh, you know nuclear energy which is vitally important to our low carbon energy mix is considered too hard or you know uh, too expensive too risky and that's what we see uh, on the next slide not this one so here, here's our challenge in numbers um, primary energy consumption may rise up to 300,000 terawatt hours per year by 2100 that's all a, a, a function of you know, uh, increased population, uh, increased services, goods, uh, the need for more water, the need for more food. That's all going to cost energy. And uh, in some cases, it may be a third of this. Uh, some other projections, uh, you know, come to two thirds of this. I always aim for the high end because I think that we should aim for energy pr prosperity for all. So on the left hand side we see the primary energy bar in blue, and on the right hand side we see the clean, the current clean electricity portion of our primary energy consumption in green. And then you have three red arrows. So the first red arrow, assuming that everything we put online today keeps running until 2050, uh, that's the portion of the 300,000 terawatt hours that we may have. Uh, decarbonized by 2050. Now, if we double that speed, uh, you see it's not going to matter, which means that we need to put online double as much nuclear power plants as we do today, double as much uh, wind turbines, double as much solar. And if we quadruple everything, we won't even get to the half. So that doesn't, that also means that we won't be, you know, completely decarbonized by 2100. That's something you can't forget. So if you look at it from a system view, and this is only a, a, a binary system view, it's a, the system view actually should be trinary instead. You also should have the government in there. But if we consider most governments part of the market, then this is what you generally get. They don't get into nuclear because they perceive some problems, waste, they perceive problems with the, the the financial risk, but also the the technological risk. 
They think that it is too expensive, but that's only because they're made to believe that it's too expensive. Everybody knows that, you know, the levelized cost of electricity metric, for instance, is malleable and is being abused to a certain extent to make people believe that it's too expensive. And then there is the final argument. It's too slow. That's what people say. And to be honest, in some cases it is. Um, yes, we can build nuclear power plants within three, four, or five years, but it requires a workforce and a country and uh, infrastructure that is ready to do so. You need you need to have you have to. All the parts must be delivered on time. The workforce must be able and capable enough to install all those components. Uh, all the necessary work uh, that needs to be done before you can start building has to be ready, you name it. And then if you look at the messaging from some of the vendors, you see that there's a disconnect because they say, oh, we are ab absolutely safe and we want to work on safety and we are the safest in the world. Secretary is saying, okay, we are, our people are the best in the world and we strive for excellence and, you know, uh, it, we are bringing the next new thing to you and this and that. And it's, it's all just window dressing. It's window dressing because actually what is happening is um, we don't see them bring new products to the market in the sense that they are bringing new reactors to the market. In the Western world at this moment, out of all the contemporary vendors that are that are pushing nuclear that have been pushing nuclear reactors to the market for the, the last 30 or 40 years, only General Electric and Hitachi, uh, are basically uh, showing us a design that might be commercially viable, the BWRX 300. But other than that, contempt uh, and we're talking about pressurized water reactors and boiling water reactors, nothing fancy really. So if you look at the other side of the world, at Russia and at China, you see that they are much more successful in selling these reactors. And that's one of the prerequisites for having reaching our decarbonization targets at one point. And to say that, you know, we are going to leave nuclear out of the equation, we're going to do it just using solar or just do, using wind or geothermal or whatever. We all know that's just, that, 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 that's an even worse disconnect because that's a disconnect from reality. That's, that's being disconnected from the fact that this, the challenge is so incredibly big, um, you know, qu quadrupling today's output in solar panels and windmills is, it's just, it's, it's not going to happen. And it's plainly because the infrastructure to do so is not there and it's not being built. Now, the same can be said for nuclear energy, by the way. So this is also a wake up call for the nuclear industry. Uh, people, you have to start building the infrastructure required to build these things at the speed that is required. The other option would be you build a tech, you, you, you invent a technology that can be brought to market faster than contemporary reactors. That's something we will come back to later. So in my enthusiasm, I wrote down this mission to empower the people to get into the low carbon energy game by helping them build a holistic and socially viable business case based on advanced nuclear. Now, this is basically, I thought, you know, we need to, Put the horse in front of the wagon because sometimes it looks like me. It looks to me like the horse is on top of the wagon, not even behind the wagon. Um, there's no. Generally, there is some interest in nuclear reactors. Most of the companies that are interested are giants, 
but these giants work like governments do, and they are incredibly slow to act. Uh, everything, everything that happens happens at a glacial pace. So, and I was inspired by Fermi Energia in Estonia, run by Kalev Kalamets, friend of mine, and he said, "Well, you know, Estonia needs uh, new power plants, and because because they're they are still burning peat." And they're building, they're burning oil, and they need to decarbonize their electricity because they are, they have some of the dirtiest in electricity in Europe, and Russia is going to cut them loose at some point in terms of energy production. And Kalev was like, "Yeah, uh, everybody wants to build windmills and and solar panels, but that's just not going to work in Estonia." Even though people are going to do that, so so he 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 started a startup, and he is right now working on a business case for a nuclear power company, and this inspired me greatly. And I saw that he was looking at you know other people in the world, and uh, that's when I came up with the idea of a nuclear of a power seeding company. So if you, but 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 it's, you know, you you can't see those. I don't I don't think that it's possible. You you, you need to have intrinsic motivation to get something like this going. So my thinking was, you know, let's consider this this hypothetical France. It's not the France that we know today. It has three power companies. It has energy company A, two and three. And they are all content with their uh, with their you know resource production. They are using uh, oil, gas, and coal, and some of them have wind and solar. None of them have uh, nuclear power plants. So I was thinking, well, let's find an entrepreneur and some nuclear physics students and some nuclear and and some economic students and you know people with business MBAs or something like that. And form, you know, a new energy company, just a very tiny work organization that works on the business case to to provide electricity and energy for the Fran for the French people at low cost using nuclear energy. But you know, given it, given our current predicament with the Corona crisis and everything, I just. I don't know. I don't know. Might be a good idea, but on the other hand, the product has to be there. The infrastructure has to be there. And I think uh, that we have failed to build the infrastructure required. If you look at China, China has the infrastructure. If you look at Russia, Russia has the infrastructure. But if you look at Europe, it doesn't look like we have the infrastructure. Or yet, you know, maybe we don't have it or... Maybe we have parts of it, but in any case, so I wanted to highlight three uh, companies at this moment uh, that I think have the ability to create a product that can be built with a relatively simple infrastructure, an infrastructure that uh, relies on building capabilities that are already present in the workforce don't need any new stuff you know that it's that uses uh that uses people that are already present in the world so the first thing is terrestrial energy uh one of my favorite companies obviously they are helping me from time to time so i have to you know full disclosure on that front um but it you know, in essence, building a nuclear reactor in a factory is better than building a nuclear reactor on site. Now, most of the components of a nuclear reactor get built in a factory in any case. But what you want is you, you want this little piping coming in and out of the reactor. You want a nuclear zone to be as small as possible so that the, the entire plant is nothing but a simple construction job, save for the nuclear island. 
And a nuclear island, if possible, doesn't have to cope with high pressures. So that's why I still like terrestrial energy. It's a, it's an integral molten salt reactor. Um, there's almost no piping coming out. Uh, it, it's a, it's a it's it, it's a it's a one pipe coming out. It has a hot liquid, and the liquid, the energy in the hot liquid, then gets returned once the energy has been extracted, and that's it basically. Maybe you have some, you know, I don't know, some cables coming in with some sensors and stuff. But that's basically it because nothing, nothing really happens. It has some, some pumps to stir the, <clears throat> to stir the salt, but that's it basically. Then there, then there's the Open 100 uh, project by Brad Coolmass and the Energy Impact Center. Um, an oldie but goodie idea, uh, well, not an old idea, but based on old technology, basically. Uh, it's just a simple pressurized water reactor or boiling water reactor. Um, it's pretty interesting. It's an open sourced idea. Uh, something like this has never been done before. Uh, as you can see here is a pressurizer. So it's a pressurized water reactor. But... Brett is pretty adamant and he says what we need to do is build nuclear reactors with you know components that anyone anyone can hoist anyone can you know anyone can build basically uh, make it as simple as possible so you don't need a very experienced workforce to put this thing together great idea great idea so this might this might you know propel the nuclear industry into another direction and the other thing that i wanted was uh was to showcase uh, fermi energia kalev kolomets holding up his uh, brochure there um great man i think uh we could use a you know if we had 1000 people 1000 ceos like kalev running around in the world we would decarbonize well before 2050. I would have no doubt in my mind. But we only have one call of Kalamets. So, yeah. Uh, Fermi Energia see, looks like they're going to uh, work with GE Tachi to build a BWRX 300 or a couple of them. In Estonia, perhaps uh, an IMSR or... A Moltex reactor or some other depends on what is ready, uh, and that's something that Kalev does very well, and Fermi Energia does very fairly well. They say we we don't want a concept; we want something that we can build, and they're aiming for tw somewhere around 2030. So uh, there you can see it's still a turnaround of 10 years or something like that. So in any case, um, nuclear industry needs to step up to the plate. We need more entrepreneurs like Kalev Kalamets. We need more practical solutions like uh, terrestrial energy and Open 100. And preferably, we would like the existing nuclear industry to, you know, get on with it and, you know, maybe maybe look at them as examples of how to work and how to move forward. Because otherwise, none of this has any uh, any value. Thank you all for watching. Have a nice day. Bye bye.